Alhamdulillah, and welcome to Prophet of Islam. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, we want to talk about Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Prophet of Islam, the last and the final messenger to mankind from Almighty God. You may be a Muslim, or you may be a non-Muslim, you may be someone who is not real sure who is Muhammad, and you'd like to know more about it. Maybe you've already heard some information. Some of it may be true. Some of it may be exaggerated. Some of it may be false. So that's why we've got the program for you, Prophet of Islam. If you'd like to follow up on this program in the future, you can go to the website called prophetofislam.com and find out more about this subject. To begin, I'd like to give you just a brief history of the life of Prophet Muhammad from the beginning. He was born in the Christian era of about 570 AD. He was born in the desert, and he was born at a time when uh, there was what they called jahiliyyah or ignorance prevalent throughout the Arabian Peninsula. People were idol worshipers for the most part, and they were li living bad. Let's just leave it at that for now, because we're going to come back to that later. But to know that he lived for about 40 years before prophethood came to him. In his whole life, I want you to listen to this closely now and imagine that even though he was surrounded by people who took drinking alcohol as a commonplace thing, they were alcoholics and drunkards, but he never had a sip of alcohol in his life from the time he was born until he passed away. Another interesting thing to note is that although there was no problem for most of them to commit adultery, have girlfriends, mistresses, and so on, so on, he never once, never once had any type of relation like this with any woman. He only was married and, uh, by the way, never divorced. His wives died, and this is an interesting thing because at the time he lived, it would have been normal for him to have, of course, done these kinds of things because everybody did it. Another thing is that they worshipped idols and statues and they had false gods of all kinds. And again, he did not participate in any of that. He never participated in any kind of false worship and that was always known about him. At a time when it was acceptable for people to lie and say whatever they wanted to promote their own agenda, he never once said a lie. In fact, throughout his whole life, those who knew him well called him the truthful because he always spoke the truth. These are some of the characteristics of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that are very obvious and stand out. So that when if, if somebody wants to say something about him and it doesn't match against what you just heard, then you have to think for yourself, where is this coming from? I recall before I was uh, a Muslim, I heard some very strange things allegedly coming from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they said he did this, he did so and so. But when we begin to investigate, we find that there's not a shred of evidence for anything like this, neither coming from the Muslim camp nor from the non-Muslims of the time. The people of the time of Muhammad were very careful about how they memorized things. It was popular at that time to do poetry, for instance. And the people would memorize what we would today consider to be pages and pages, and even books worth of poetry, and get it letter perfect. So it was easy for them to know if somebody was really saying the truth or not, because they had these memories. They could remember, you said so and so and so and such, this person said so and so and so and such, and now let's compare it. And of course, being able to do that, they could quickly identify if somebody was telling the truth or not. I mentioned the poetry for a reason because at that time there was competition amongst all of the Bedouin Arabs to have uh, the ability to speak like this, to be able to put things into poetry and just speak ad infinitum and to continue to be able to say whatever you wanted to say but in a way that it would either rhyme or make uh, some kind of a, a structure of poetry. To, and so when he, peace be upon him, came with the Qur'an, it was so amazing. First of all, he never did that before. He had not indulged in any kind of poetry. He wasn't a poet uh, or a singer or anything like this. 
So now when the Quran comes to him, it comes in a way that is so much more powerful than any poetry they'd ever heard. The structure of the Arabic grammar in the Quran is so amazing that even today when they teach the Arabic language in classes in universities around the world, even if they're not Muslim, they still have to come to the Quran as the very basis of the Arabic language. And it is the criterion even today to match up your Arabic against it to see how you're doing with it. It's interesting because one of the names of the Quran is the criterion. But we can talk about that some other time. I just wanted to mention a few of the basic things that you would understand to give some kind of credibility to the story I'm presenting to you. Another thing is that there's so much documentation about Muhammad, peace be upon him, that has been preserved accurately and authentica authentically preserved in a way that we can know for sure that it's true. There has never been a person on earth that's had more written about them than Prophet Muhammad, and it is preserved even today, and you can find these texts throughout the world. Now, let us talk about the relationship that Muhammad, peace be upon him, had with the people around him, and I think this will help you to understand probably better than anything else. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, insisted that if you were a true believer, your relationship with others had to indicate that. It couldn't be that you could just say some magic words and then get by and you'd have salvation. In fact, according to the teachings of Islam, from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, salvation doesn't come about with just speaking a few words. It comes from deeds and actions, beliefs that are put into practice. And if a person can't do that, if they're not willing to do that, then they might as well give up because that's what Islam is about. It's not just what you say, it's what you do about what you say. So belief and actions have to be together. And it has to be reflected in your relationship with the people. The word Islam itself means to surrender, submit, obey, in sincerity to Almighty God in peace. This is the whole meaning of this word in English. So if somebody did this, they would be called a Mu Islam because you put this letter meme in front of the verb instead of the letters ER after the verb. In English, we say walker, talker, thinker. And in Arabic, you put Mu in front of the verb to indicate the one who does it. So Muslim is the one who does Islam. And Islam is about the relationship between the person and God. And it's clear that if a person is submitting and surrendering and obeying, then he is in a subjugated position. This means that the person is the slave. The person is the servant. To who? To Almighty Allah. So he becomes the master. Allah, God Almighty, is the master, the king, the ruler, and the human being then is the one who is the servant to the ruler. So this is the relationship now between the human being and Almighty God. Well, you'll find this clearly even in the teachings of the, what remains of the Bible because of the idea that says God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if somebody said that to you today, you say, well, okay, he's preaching out of the Bible. But we find that that is the exact teaching that's coming with Muhammad, peace be upon him. You want to be successful with God, then you want his will, not your will. Your choices will be according to what God has ordained, following the commandments. Now this is one of the teachings of Muhammad. One of the clearest teachings is your relationship with your Lord. But watch this. Immediately after the relationship with your Lord is the relationship with the people. And who is first? Who is the first person after your relationship with your Lord? Well, it's your relationship with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. He's dead. But what he left, his legacy, is the Quran. So what's your relationship to the Quran? He left teachings that go along with it called Hadith. And what is your relationship to his teachings? Because if you're following that and obeying that, then you have established this proper relationship. And after Allah and his messenger, which is Muhammad, who is next? Who is the most logical person? If your relation is 
correct with your Lord and with his prophet, then who is the next person you should have a good relationship with? A lot of people would say, well, my husband or my wife. Some would say, you know, maybe my children. But interestingly enough, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it's your mother. And they were surprised. He said, it's your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. Look at this. So the parents are very important. This is key. Well, wait a minute. You go back and you look in the Bible, and you find this is in the commandments, isn't it? After the first commandments that come, talking about your relationship with God, go back and look at the first commandment, second commandment, third commandment, fourth commandment, are all talking about your relationship with God. The fifth commandment is your relationship with your parents. And it better be good or you're in big trouble. Now, what if they're not Muslim? doesn't matter. You still have to have a good relationship with them. Then after your parents, who? Well, then obviously your family, your siblings, your wife, husband. But look at this. Islam is also teaching that you have to have a good relationship with yourself. This is long before we had Sigmund Freud to tell us about psychiatry, isn't it? 1,400 years ago, to take care of your body, to take care of your mind, to take care of yourself. Your body has rights. Islam is teaching this. This is all coming from Muhammad, peace be upon him. Teaching people to be responsible and not lie. Now this is something very important with your relationship with Allah, the messenger, yourself, your family, your neighbors, and the general public. It isn't possible for a person to be a liar and a Muslim at the same time. This was taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Can you imagine that? That somebody is saying that if you lie, you can't, you can't go to paradise? Muslims are committed to that. They must tell the truth. I realize in the world that we live in today that it's just taken for granted that there are certain white lies that anybody could tell. Cheating on your income tax. I mean, you know, come on, doesn't everybody do that? Running a red light if there's no cop around. Nobody here? Okay, psh, just go through the red light. Cheating and lying are things that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, forbid others to do it, and he forbid himself to do it. These things he never did. I want to continue about this idea of the relationship between others because it comes under the form of human rights. If you realize that we talk about the Geneva Convention and the rights that were given to nations and individuals at the same time, you go back and look 1400 years before though, you'll see that it was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that said even the enemies have rights. Enemies have rights. If you capture an enemy, you're not allowed to torture them. Well, that's interesting, especially in consideration of the things we hear about going on today, isn't it? The enemies have rights to the extent that they, of course, would have a fair trial. They would have the opportunity to defend themselves, naturally. But on top of that, they have the right to the same food as their captors. They have the right to the same protection as the captors. They have the right to the same shelter. They have the right to the... Essentially, the only difference is that they can't go running around where they want to go. But if they would like to look into Islam, explore Islam, become Muslims, then they would be freed. They wouldn't be enemies anymore, and they would be allowed to go free. So these are some of the things when we talk about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we should consider. What is the source that we took the information from? Where did we actually hear the information, and how reliable is the information? Can we authenticate it, where it came from? And then let us consider the, what the teaching is. What, what is it saying? It's talking about having a good relationship. And what is it forbidding? It's forbidding the very things that moral societies are always forbidding. Staying away from things that confuse the mind. Drugs and alcohol are forbidden in Islam. Staying away from things that corrupt society. From promiscuity. And from addictions. And from lying and cheating. And to be an image of the very thing that you're preaching, which, of course, Prophet Muhammad was. I want to mention something that, that Allah said in the Quran about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He tells us in the Quran that he sent Prophet Muhammad 
as a Rahma to the Alameen. He is a mercy to the worlds. And I think that's a good place for us to wrap up this segment of the program that we want to do. But I invite you to come back and listen again to more of the subject about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Islam. And don't forget to visit that website I told you about, prophetofislam.com. Until next time, peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, and welcome to Prophet of Islam. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and I would like to today talk about the Prophet of Islam, and by the way, remind you that there is a website called Prophet of Islam that you can get more details anytime you like. One of the things that's very key about Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, is the way he taught us to think about our Lord and what to do about it, how to worship your Lord. First of all is to know your Lord, to know who is God, and then know what he wants, and then do your best to perform it. Now, in other religions, there is a belief in God. Almost, almost every religion I've ever studied, I found that there's belief in one God, at least at the base of everything. And to say that God is one is a very good thing in Islam. It's like very important to hear somebody say God is one. But that is not the absolute message of Islam, believe it or not. Because the message that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with says, La ilaha illa Allah. This does not say God is one. It doesn't say that. It says something bigger than that, even more important than that. So let's look at what is this message that he came with. By the way, we refer to Prophet Muhammad as the messenger, messenger of God. And it's important to know the message, and that's what we're talking about in this segment. La means no. And you go into any Arab household and watch children running around, doing things, breaking things, you know what the children do. The mother will be there saying, la, 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 la. And it means no, 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 no. So the first word we have right away is la. It means no. Ila is the next word. Ila, it literally means God, G-O-D. The same word, if you look it up in the dictionary or the Maurid dictionary in Arabic, God is Ilah, something worshipped, something that you give devotion to, something you sacrifice to, something you turn to when you need help, you call upon it in times of need. This is your God, whatever you worship. And some people it can be money, some people it could be, you know, a position that they have or wealth or, you know. But in the case of this word Ilah, here it's being used to represent any kind of God. It says there is no kind of God. There's no kind of deity anywhere, any place, any time. This is the implication. It says illa, which means except Allah. Now, some people said Allah means God. But if it did, then it would say la ilaha illa illa. Well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but in, in English, that is what people often say. They say there's no God but God. And if you translate that to Arabic, people will laugh at you. And they will say, what are you saying? There's no God but God. That's like saying there's no car but car. It doesn't make any sense. The reason is because English is deficient. It's missing a word, the word Allah. You don't have it in English. In fact, when people translated the Bible to the English language, they substituted a word rather than to come up with the word Allah. They substituted the word God twice. God meaning anything worshipped, and then God meaning the only one to worship. And they used the big G. And when they used a the big G, they said, this is God, G-O-D. But whenever you start a sentence and write it, you have to put a big G anyway. So you wouldn't know if you meant God, God, or God, a God, and so on. Also, when you're talking to people, there's no difference in the word, God or God. You mean this God, this fake God, or do you mean the God? Some people thought that the, in translation that the word Allah meant the God, but actually it's more than that even, because the word Elah can be uh, multiplied and can have many Elahs, there can be many gods. But the word Allah cannot have a plural form in Arabic language. It's interesting too to note 
that it cannot have a gender, cannot have a male or female gender. Now, right away, I know what's going to happen. You're going to have somebody come to you and say, well, wait a minute. Look, in the Quran, in the translation, uh, it says clearly, Allah says, we, us, and our. And how is this that Allah is saying these things in there? And you said he can't be plural. So we know right away there's going to be some discrepancy here. And let me clear that up for you. This is called the royal we. What the king or the queen say when they give any official decree, they always say we. Even the English provides for this. It's the royal we, not royal plural, royal we. That's how Allah is speaking of himself in the Quran. But Allah is one without any partners and there is no way to make this plural. The second part is they'll say, well, gender, and everywhere you always say he, he, him, his, you're always saying that. But again, this is the language, the structure of the language, and it doesn't indicate even for a second or imply that there's gender related here. It's not that God is female or male. It is clear that Allah is so unique that he's not like his creation. Let me quote to you from the Quran, Laysa kamitlihi shayin wa huwa samim basir. It says here that Allah is not like anything in his creation at all. And at the same time, he is all hearing and he's all seeing, which is definitely not like the kind of hearing and seeing that we have. In fact, uh, if I think about it, I can see what's in front of me, but I can't see what's behind me. I sure can't see what's over me and under me at the same time. I'm not able to see past so many miles and then my vision gives out. And uh, if it's dark, I'm not able to see anything. So I'm very limited. Whereas Allah is saying that he is all seeing all the time from one end of the universe to the other. The same holds true for his hearing. The hearing of Allah is not like the hearing of a human being. It's absolute. So now we have Muhammad, peace be upon him, telling us about Allah, who is Allah. And he's telling this, everything about Allah is absolute. Allah is absolutely and completely the epitome of each of the words. Allah doesn't just say the truth. Allah is the truth. Allah doesn't provide light. Allah is light. Allah is on nur. So each and every one of the characteristics of Almighty Allah as taught to us by Muhammad is perfect in every way. And there's no way Allah could ever be the opposite of that. So this clears up a lot of mystery right away. And you can get more information about this when you check out the websites about it. Look at the prophetofislam.com and when you go there, you can see what Muhammad taught, peace be upon him, but important too is what people said about him. What did the people around him say about him? What did his companions say about him? It's there on the website. What did his wives say about him? You hear a lot of stories about his wives. Get the truth about this one. You'll be surprised to find that it's his wives telling these wonderful stories and you would be very pleased to read this. And then what did his enemies say about him? It's also there. And then what have many famous people all through the centuries said about Prophet Muhammad? What did Gandhi say? And what did George Bernard Shaw say? Find out, go there and learn for yourself. And while you're at it, check out Muhammad A to Z. It's also in the same website. I hope that some way that our program has helped you to better understand some of the things about Muhammad, peace be upon him, and led you to be able to go and research and find more information. Certainly this is the reason behind what we're doing. We hope that Allah will accept from us and guide you to the straight path of Muhammad that he brought for the human beings. After all, Allah said, he's the Rahman to the Alameen. He is the mercy to the worlds. Until next time, it's Yusuf Estes. Salam alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, and welcome to Prophet of Islam. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. For the next few minutes, we want to continue some of the talking we've had about the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. I would like to mention that the Prophet Muhammad never claimed to be the only Prophet of Allah, nor did he say that he was bringing some new message or that he was having a new religion. All of these things may have been attributed to him by others, but in fact this is the opposite of what he taught. 
Let us begin at the very beginning. He says to us that Allah is the originator of everything that exists. All of the creation and the universe is coming from this one God. And then the first of the creation of human beings is somebody named Adam. Well, of course, if you're a Jew or a Christian, you already know that that's the name of the first man. So this is not new information. And that Adam sinned by disobeying Allah and eating from fruit. Well, we know that to be true again in the other monotheistic faiths. Then he tells us that Adam has from his own bone his wife, which is Eve. Again, nothing new here. Two sons are born. Again, nothing new. One son kills the other. Same story again. He continues by telling us the story of Adam, Abraham. He tells us about Moses, and he tells us about David and Suleiman, and many other prophets as well. But along the way, he's clear about the subject, that each and every one of these great prophets brought the exact same message nothing new they all said there's only one god and you have to worship him alone with no gods beside him this message actually is something that for so long we can identify with the jewish faith the children of israel we can identify it also with the message that comes with jesus the christ the messiah it's the message that we learn from the Quran and from Muhammad to be a continuation, actually, of the same message that came in the beginning. And of course, we've mentioned this many times, but it's always worth mentioning again. The message is, La ilaha illallah. There is none to be worshipped, no gods. Nothing worthy of worship except one, Allah, only Allah. Now, let's look at the prophethood of all of these prophets. What does it take to be a prophet? What's the job description? Well, first of all, they have to have impeccable character. Each of the prophets has to be notable for their honesty and integrity because otherwise, how would we know that they told us the truth? So this would be an important characteristic of each one of these prophets, that they must be truthful. Adam was truthful. He sinned, yeah, but he still was truthful. He never denied that he sinned. Abraham was truthful. Moses was truthful. David, Suleiman, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, obviously very truthful. Always tell the truth. So we understand immediately that this is a qualification of all the prophets and the brotherhood, if you will, of the prophets. Another one is that you can't cheat. They couldn't cheat, take things away from other people. And we look through, again, the prophets, and we say, yes, that's true. They never cheated anyone. Another thing that we notice, a similarity here, is that they all talk about giving up the material wealth, giving up the things of this world in favor of the things of the next world. Not to be so attached to the world here that was around us that we begin to worship it instead of the one who created it. You might even say, the message could be, worship the creator, not his creations. And we find that that's exactly the meaning of what we learned from prophet John the Baptist. Peace be upon him. And Jesus, peace be upon him. And again, we come back to Muhammad, peace be upon him, saying the same thing. So we're finding this same path, this same avenue or boulevard, if you will, of all of these prophets saying and teaching the same thing. Worship God on his terms. So these are some of the criterion to be a prophet. Now, in the Arabic language, you actually have two distinctions that you can talk about. One is a nabi. This would be a prophet, a nabi. The plural is anbiya. This is any of them who brought the message and said to the people, worship God, follow me, and don't commit these big sins worship him and turn to him in repentance and this is basically what we'll say is a prophet or a nabi but if they brought scripture with them in other words if they were sent with actual uh, message that is written down and kept and it's something coming from god we will mention for instance abraham moses 
David, Suleiman, we'll say what is the Old Testament, if you will, and the Psalms or Zabur that come with them, then these prophets have another distinction. They're still Anbiya, but they have another higher distinction called a messenger. And in Arabic, Arsala or Risala, a message, and then the one who gives this message is a Rasul. So we understand now that if they have this distinction, a Rasul, he is a messenger coming with the message that is uh, passed on to the people. And then he's also an Anbiya or a Nabi from Allah. According to what we understand as Muslims, that each and every one of these prophets fit the description and they all fit in there. Now, in some other teachings, in the older form of the same religion from the children of Israel and from the Christians, you will find different levels here because you'll find that according to them, these prophets made some serious mistakes. We don't have that in Islam. We want to be sure and clarify this. We do not attribute major sins to any of these prophets. After all, how could they be the example for us if they were committing adultery or committing what's called in Arabic zina, if they're drinking alcohol, if they are gambling or cheating or lying and some of the things that maybe some people have attributed to these great men. But we say, no, that's not true. The Quran clears them of these sins that have been attributed to them and lets us know that they're humans, they make human mistakes, but they don't make the big mistakes. After all, again, how could they be examples for us as messengers and uh, teachers of this message if they didn't follow it themselves? So I think that's a, a way to clarify how we understand prophethood in Islam. Now, another thing that we would like to mention is that what Allah says in the Quran, now the Quran comes to Muhammad as his message, just as the New Testament came to Jesus, just as the Psalms came to David, just as the Old Testament came to the prophet Moses and some of the others as well. Now, in the Quran, we find a teaching that's real clear that says that we mustn't make any separation or distinction between the prophets. We hold all of them in the highest esteem. I'd like for you to kind of think with me for a minute what we're talking about. We're raising these prophets up. They're not uh, just an average human being anymore. They're, they're the best of the human beings. But we don't put them up in the level with angels or gods or sons of gods. No, we don't do that. So what we do, we bring the prophets up to the highest level of humanity. These are the prophets. But in the case of Jesus, now be careful because we're going to say that no, we don't have Jesus as a God or a son of a God. We bring him down to this level of the highest of the humans. So here is Jesus as the highest of the humans along with these other great prophets. So it's one prophethood. And this is where Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, fits into the picture. He is the Khatam and the Anbiya. He is the seal of all of these prophets. He's the last to come. Now, before we leave the topic, though, I need to tell you something. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And he will return because this is part of his miracles that have been predicted, and it is going to happen. So, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last to come, but he's telling us that Jesus will return but not with any new message, not with any new prophethood, but rather to fulfill scripture. We have Adam as the first prophet, then continues down through all the prophets, and we've mentioned before to Abraham and Moses and David, Suleiman, Jesus Christ, let's don't forget about John the Baptist, and of course, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All of them, peace be upon all of them. So all of them are prophets, so there's one prophethood, one brotherhood of prophets, and all of them coming with the same exact message, worship God, don't worship what he created. Turn to him and find what he wants for you, and then try your best to do his will on earth as it is in heaven. This is the teaching that we find in the Bible, and this is the teaching we find in the Quran, and 
the hadiths or teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. If somebody came along later and attributed things to these prophets which they didn't do, that doesn't change the message. Some people have tried to say that Prophet Lut, you call him Lot perhaps, but they say that Prophet Lut had committed a horrible sin with his two daughters. He had done something so bad, I don't even want to mention it on television. It's that bad. And it's recorded in the Bible as though it was just a simple fact. But this is not acceptable to the Muslims. We don't accept that. That's not a, a reality to us. We say it's not true. He didn't do it because he can't do that and still be a prophet. Additionally, there are some things attributed to the prophet Dawood or David saying that he committed some sin with a man's wife. Again, this is not acceptable to us as Muslims. We know better. A horrible thing attributed to the prophet Moses that, uh, and his brother Harun talking about that they would even allow for a second that other than Allah would be worshipped and they would never have done that. This would be totally away from the message of Islam. Then uh, Jesus, and this is very important to us to know that Jesus, peace be upon him, is a miracle birth, yes. And he certainly came with this same message, yes. And he did miracles, yes, but so did other prophets. The fact that he didn't have a father doesn't mean that he's God any more than Adam not having a father or a mother doesn't make him God either. But what we have with Jesus for us as Muslims, this is somebody who's very high up. We don't have any of his any sins attributed to him. We consider him very pure and certainly the best of the human beings, but he would never have claimed to have been a God or a partner alongside of God, because this would break the very first commandment that Jesus preached, which was that to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you have to worship him with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. How could this be true if he was talking about himself? And certainly it would go against the New Testament, the Old Testament's teachings, where it says there's only one God and that uh, you worship him. The other thing we find in the Quran is the same thing, saying that Jesus categorically denies any kind of uh, sonship of, along with uh, you know, being a son of God or something like this, that he says he didn't teach that, that he told people to worship your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord. And this is what we find in Quran. We do find the same thing in the Bible as well. Again, when people attribute something to these prophets and lie about them and say they, things that they didn't say and say that they did X or Y or Z, they didn't do those things. So regardless of what somebody says about them, it doesn't change the fact. People today lie about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as well. And you can find out for yourself. You can verify what I'm talking about very easily. One of the things we know in Islam, Muslims cannot lie because if they do, they do not get to go to paradise. Liars do not enter paradise. It, they, you, if a person lies, he has to repent from that and be away from that. And actually, uh, if he continues in it, he still is not going to go into paradise. So that's number one. Number two, the information about Prophet Muhammad and his teaching has been preserved and authenticated throughout these last 14 centuries. Even if somebody told you a lie, you could verify it easily because there are not two versions of the Quran. There are not two versions of the collection of hadiths or teachings called Sahih Bukhari. There's only one, and Sahih Muslim, there's only one. So we know for sure, if somebody said, well, uh, here's a, a teaching, you know, and you're gonna say, well, where did you get it from? He says, I got it from Sahih Bukhari. Okay, well, I have a copy myself, let's go look. If we don't find that, it means what? It means that somebody's not telling the truth. So before you accept any information, especially derogatory information about these great prophets, all you have to do is investigate. And where can you investigate, you ask? <laughs> and of course we have the answer. Come to our website. We have a website called prophetofislam.com. Prophetofislam.com. When you come to the website, you'll be able to find answers to your questions. We put the questions for you so you can just click and get the answers. 
we hope you to benefit from our program and enjoy it as much as we've enjoyed doing it. And until next time, I'm Yusuf Estes, wishing you the best of guidance from Almighty God and peace. Salam alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching Prophet of Islam. I'm Yusuf Estes, and I want to begin the program today by reminding you, you can always go to our website, prophetofislam.com, to get more information and more details about the things that we'll be talking about today. One of the things I'd like to do now is to talk about some of the criticism against our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Because this is a reality that people are saying things which are not true. But on the other hand, it's proper for us, I believe, to bring what the evidence is rather than just say, uh-uh, uh-huh, uh-uh, and it goes nowhere. So this is critical for us, I think, at this uh, point in time to bring out the evidences. You see, Islam is based on a couple of things that are very clear from the beginning, which is, number one, Muslims have to always tell the truth. If they don't, they can go to hell. Uh, this is serious. Number two is we have the proof. The Quran and the teachings of Muhammad have been preserved and they have not been altered or changed in any way. So we have these to rely on. We can produce the evidences. Even if people said that that's not true, well then let them bring a stronger evidence. I think one of the beautiful things about Islam is that it offers that if you can find something better, take it. If you find something that's more authentic, that you can verify, always go with that that you can verify. And Islam is offering us clear proof. The historical text of the Quran and the Sunnah or Hadith of Muhammad are there. It's not a question of which manuscript or which time period or who said what about something else. It's, it's very clear and that, that we don't have a doubt on this. So let us begin by uh, an example and see where we go with this. We have people ask us, what about the marriage of Prophet Muhammad to his wife Aisha? They say that she was only six years old. And how could it be that a man, a grown man, 50 years old or so, would marry a girl six? Well, first of all, I would like to make you aware of something. At the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was no age limit whatsoever. In fact, it's known that at his time, men used to marry a little girl, even if she was two or three years old, not for sexual purposes, but to take the inheritance of an orphan girl. This was a common practice. That's why in the Quran, it forbids people to do that. Read chapter four, the women, and it starts out by ordering the people, the men especially here, saying don't marry these little girls to get their wealth away from them. That's verse two. Verse three says, marry other women of your choice. So it's very clear here what's going on with that. Now in the same chapter, verse 19 in chapter four, we find something that says you cannot inherit women against their will. The meaning here is for the believers, because it says, amanu. you who believe, don't take over women, don't uh, possess them. It's not your right to do that. You can get married to them, but you can't own them and you can't force them. A woman always has the right to decide who she wants to marry. You can suggest, especially if you're the father or the brother of the lady, you can say, well, we know this guy, he's pretty nice, and she can say yes or no to that choice. But it's up to her ultimately to decide who she wants to spend her life with. So this is very important. Now if you said, well, I know some people didn't do that. So, and your point, that means they didn't follow Islam because Islam is teaching that. It's very clear here, the Quran says that. So if they do other than that, it means they didn't follow the teaching. Make sense? Now, the evidence that we have, we ourselves can prove what happened. You wanna talk about the age of Aisha, that's the name of the wife of Prophet Muhammad. That comes to us from the very Hadith I was just telling you about. And who is the one narrating the Hadith to us to start with? It's Aisha. She's telling us, so I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you accept her testimony? If she were in a court of law, would you accept her testimony? If you said yes, fine and good. If you said no, then there's no point in going any further. 
And then I would ask you, do you accept everything she said or just some things? Otherwise, if she, uh, you know, hostile witnesses they would use in legal term. Because if she is, then how do we know for sure what she's saying is true? So this is something for us to begin with. Now let us look at what she says. She tells us that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was of the best of character. He was the best person. And he is the best friend to her father. Her father is a well-known and established person of truth in the community. And he has a, 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 a level of honor and dignity that can't be questioned. This is Abu Bakr. That's her father. Now, in the story that she's talking about, it's recorded in Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic of hadiths. And it says that while she was about six years old, her mother came out to her and she was playing with some toys in the dirt and her mother told her to come in the house and she took her inside and there's her father. So far, we're not hearing anything about marriage or anything. She just says she's being brought in and there's her father, her mother, and the best friend of her father, which is Muhammad, and the marriage offer is taking place. Ah offer of marriage. But then she said she went back outside and was playing in the dirt again. What does that indicate to you? There's definitely no mention of any sex here at all. And if somebody read that into it, they, they need some help. They need to stay out of the checkout line at the supermarket and stop reading all of these magazines because that's not what it says. In fact, that the, she is back outside playing in the dirt indicates what? That they didn't get married. Not at that time. Why? She wasn't old enough. A girl has to be mature enough to have babies before she can have marriage in Islam, regardless of how intellectual she may appear. If she's not old enough to have babies, she can't get married. So it didn't happen. That's why there's another saying, a teaching in Islam, in Sahih Bukhari, saying the age is older. Several years later, the same incidents take place. Her mother again takes her in the house. Again, her father is offering marriage to his best friend. This was common. This was their custom. Let's offer marriage of our daughter to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And at this stage, it was accepted. Why? She was older. She was old enough to make the choice. And she was old enough to have children. And it gave the example to us as human beings to know what's the limit. Because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came as the example. The example for human beings. So it means he had to do this. He had to marry a very old lady, which he did. He, and a lady who was too old to even have children. He also married a girl who was very young, which was Aisha. But she was old enough to have children and old enough to make the decision. And it was left up to her. And she made the decision. She wanted to marry him. So if you have in your mind something dirty, if you have something in your mind, is something sick, then this is in your mind. But it is not in the Hadith, it's not in the teaching of Islam, and it's sure not in the Quran. These things are what's forbidden in Islam. These things are called zina. Zina is forbidden. Whoever commits this, this is a very serious crime in Islam, and whoever does such a thing like this could be punished in this life, and they could be punished in the next life. So obviously, Islam is coming to teach us what not to do, as well as what to do, and what the limits are. We always talk about rights. But sometimes we have to remember what the limits are. Now let's cap it off by saying this. Aisha, radiallahu anha, may Allah accept from her, tells us of the best of experiences in her marriage to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of their relationship sexually. She talks about it. What we know as Muslims today of what's permissible and not permissible in Islam is coming from her. She's our teacher. She became known as the mother of the believers and taught all of us all of these things. This is coming from her. And she talks about a glowing report of their relationship with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. How they ran and played together, enjoyed each other's company. How he was such of the best of husbands. And she never, ever said a bad word against her husband. Now, he died, peace be upon him, when she was very young yet. Maybe, only a baby close to 20 years old. Can you imagine this? And she never remarried again. She never wanted to even date any man or go out with any man or ever get married again. That was it. She was married to Prophet Muhammad in this life and she talked the best about him up until she died nearly 70 years old. Can you imagine this? Never said a bad word against her husband. Do you know any women like this? And she talked about a relationship where they were in love together, both believing in God in the hereafter and not disobeying their parents but obeying the parents 
as much as they can and obeying Allah and he's dying, then when she dies, she's in full belief that they'll be reunited again, reunited in the paradise to live happily ever after. Now, if you hear this story, do you like this better or do you like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet? Shakespeare's story is about the same age children out here, like, uh, what is it, 12, 13 years old, and they're doing something behind their parents' back, sneaking around. They didn't get married. And then one of them kills himself, and then the other one kills themselves. And this is called the love story? Romeo and Juliet, the double suicide? And you respect this story, but the truth of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Aisha is so beautiful. It's so sweet. And why can't you see the truth? So this is just one example. I want you to go to, take some time, go to the website called prophetofislam.com. Find out for yourself what the real truth is about the real Muhammad. I'm Yusuf Estes, and until next time, I pray for guidance for you, for me, for all the people, and until the next time, peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you are watching Prophet of Islam. I'm Yusuf Estes, and I'm happy to be with you today to continue our discussion of who is Prophet Muhammad exactly? Who is this man that we've talked about so much? More has been written about him and discussed about him probably than any other person on earth. I recall back in the 1970s, Michael Hart, wrote a book about the 100 most influential men in the history of the world. And surprisingly enough, he put Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as number one. It doesn't surprise us as Muslims that he would put Muhammad number one, but what surprises us is that he's not a Muslim, and yet he still recognizes the influence that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had on so many people. This in itself is another evidence of the truth of Islam. Because all in all, when you look at the one and a half billion human beings walking on the earth today, claiming to be followers of Muhammad, we find from them, by and large, a very excellent character. Although there's been a lot in the Western media talking against Islam, talking against Muslims, speaking against the Quran and talking against Muhammad specifically, we can balance that very nicely with truth and find out what exactly is the story here. I want to use an example in today's program, something that I think is uh, a very vicious and serious thing, and that's when people only quote part of a verse quote, part of a text or corrupt the text to be other than what it was. Because when people do this, this is not just maligning someone. This is not just lying. This is really, in an essence, making up your own religion or your own misguidance and taking people away from truth. If the truth is there, this is what you need to bear witness to. Otherwise, what are you saying? Because if you say in your religion it's okay to lie, what kind of religion is that? Islam forbids that. Lying, prevaricating, distorting the truth, leaving out part of the truth, all of these things fall under the same category called kadib, one who does not talk, uh, speak the truth, who is not saying the truthful things, is kadib, and he's a liar and he will go to hell. Let me give you an example about that. In the Quran, there's a verse that people refer to in the English language and they only give part of it and then they add a little bit to it to make it sound different. And I've seen this, unbelievable. When you know the Quran and you hear somebody do this, it shocks you. And someone's standing on a platform in a university or in a public place and he says, the Quran says, Kill all the Jews and Christians wherever you find them. Can you imagine? I wouldn't blame anybody. If that was true, I'd be scared to death. A one and a half billion people have been ordered to kill the Jews and Christians? Whoa, that sounds pretty fantastic. Now there's going to be an immediate problem, though. How come in 1,400 years they didn't do it? In 1,400 years, 
You don't see anybody wiping out all the Jews and all the Christians. In fact, there are several places on earth today where Jews and Christians are enjoying the protection of the Muslims. Syria is an example of that. When they made the movie Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson went all the way to Syria to learn the language of the Aramaic Christians there so that he could produce his program. They are still speaking the Aramaic language of Jesus, and that's why he used it. That's why he went there. And this small little pocket of people, this, they're farmers, like the Amish people in Pennsylvania or Ohio or Indiana. This is small farmers, it's just a little village. <laughs> and who's protecting them all these centuries is the Muslims. And what about the Jews, the Yahudi, who are being protected for many centuries when the Christians came into Spain? Spain was ruled by the Muslims. Oh, you didn't know about that. Okay, well, when the Catholics came in, they were killing anybody who didn't say God is three, the Trinity. The Jews, uh, along with the Muslims, escaped. Where did they go? They went to Morocco. And the Moroccan Muslims protected the Muslims and the Jews. Some of the Jews went all the way to Egypt, and they were protected there as well. And some of their greatest scholars were right there in Egypt that they quote from today. Now, how, if the Quran said this teaching, how come the Muslims forgot about it? How come they didn't know about it? And in fact, that it's not true. It's not true whatsoever. But I will tell you a verse that is true. You can go look at it. And then you can go back and you can ask somebody, why didn't you quote the whole verse? And why did you add things to the verse that are not there? The verse is in chapter 2 of the Quran, Surah Baqarah. And the number is 191. And in, it, in the Arabic language, it says, Waqtuluhum. And sometimes they translate it as, and kill them wherever you find them. And then it keeps going. And turn them out from the places where they turned you out. Oh, what's that about? Well, you have to go back some verses to find out. And by the way, you don't find any reference here to Jews and Christians because that's not who it was talking about. You have to go back to verse 189. And it says here, they're asking you, Muhammad, about the new moon. And the answer is, coming from Allah, that the new moon is so you can judge when to do your hajj, your pilgrimage. They're asking you about entering their houses by the back doors. Is that good luck? Is that righteousness? Is that the way to go? And no, it's not. Enter your house by proper doors. Righteousness is something from your heart. And then it continues in the next verse, and it says regarding the hajj, the pilgrimage, to go ahead and make their pilgrimage. And then if the people are going to fight you when you go back to the pilgrimage, which is Mecca, where the idolaters were, the people who were their own relatives, they, these were the mushrikeen, these were the people who didn't believe in God, they believed in these idols and statues, they were the same ones who turned them out, the same ones who had persecuted them, the same ones who had raped their women, the same ones who had killed them and abused them, and turned them away, turned them off of their own property. Ah. It says, fight them, but the kind of fighting here, kital, means combat. So combat them. Use this word, and if you have a Quran and you're looking at it, in this verse 190, use this word instead of fight, because it's the same word used in the next verse, kital. It means to do what? Combat them if they combat you. But if they stop, then you have to stop. Otherwise, you're the... Thalimun. You're the one who is the oppressor, and verily Allah does not love the oppressors. Now what do you think about that? Because then it continues, and kill them in combat, if they kill you in combat, turn them out from where they turned you out. Because this is very clear now what it's talking about, that you've got a, a, a fight going on here, a, a, an altercation that's a combat. You've got a battle going on. So what must you do? So you stop everything and focus on engaging in this battle. And you fight them. And if they're killing you, you have permission from God to kill. 
because you see up until this point they had never had this permission before these guys had been killing them for 13 years straight but the Muslims had not been permitted to engage in any war against them because if they had they wouldn't have been able to distinguish that from the kind of wars that these people always had Prior to Islam, the Arab community was always engaged in feuds of some kind in killing one tribe and killing another tribe. But when they came into Islam, they were forbidden to do this. There was no more killing of anybody. In fact, that's one of the biggest teachings of Islam, that you can never kill an innocent soul. If you take one innocent soul, it's as though you killed all of humanity. But if you save an innocent soul, it's the same as if you saved all of humanity. If you understand that, you can see that this teaching here in the Quran could not have meant anything other than to retaliate equal to what's coming to you. But as soon as they stop, you have to stop. And then Allah continues by saying that verily that this combat, this kind of fighting is better than the fitna or terrorism that these people are causing against you. Because that's exactly what it was. The acts of terrorism coming against the Muslims by the non-believers, these were the idolaters, had nothing to do with Christians, nothing to do with the Jews, and in fact it was talking about people that turned them off of their own property that they could go back now and perform their pilgrimage and they could even reclaim their property. That's all it said. But again, repeating that if they stop, you must stop, otherwise you're the oppressor. Now, why would somebody say that Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with some kind of message other than that? He clearly taught the people what really uh, combat was about and what the limits were. How could somebody misquote this? And I think that's a good place for us to give you a chance to reflect. Go to the website, get some more information about it. It's called prophetofislam.com. That's prophetofislam.com. See what you find there. Until next time, peace. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Prophet of Islam. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and today I'd like to continue talking about some of the attacks or harsh questions presented to Islam in general and specifically toward the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the message that he brought. Many times when we hear people talk about something related to Islam, we have to ask ourselves, what is the evidence, what is the proof of what they are saying? Because there are so many different opinions. A person cannot really be two things at the same time. They cannot really be uh, good and bad at the same time. So how could we distinguish or differentiate between what is being said uh, as a reality? Somebody said Prophet Muhammad is good. Somebody else said he's bad. Somebody else says that he lies. Somebody else said he tells the truth. Somebody says that he is, you know, a womanizer. Somebody else says, no, he's the opposite, teaching against that. So how do we know what would be the evidences? I want to caution anyone, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, that in Islam, the truth must prevail because that is the teaching in the Quran itself. Truth prevails over all else. When truth comes, it destroys falsehood. This is the teaching of the Quran itself. You might like to check that out, verse 17, uh, chapter 17, that's Surah Isra, Al-Isra, verse number 81. Check it out and it says that verily the truth will come and it will destroy falsehood that the truth always destroys the falsehood. So that's the teaching in Islam. Another thing is the evidences. What evidences do we have for what we say? Almost everything we know about Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him originates from the very people who were around him. That's true. What we know about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are uh, hadiths, teachings, sayings, stories coming to us from people who personally knew him. Some of the people were not Muslims at the time in the beginning. They became Muslims later. Some were Muslim right from the very beginning, such as Abu Bakr, his very dear and trusted friend. Then there were others along the way who 
came to Islam even after he had passed away. And all of them talk about their relationship or what they knew about Muhammad and in ways that if you compare them, it's the same person. It's, there's not two different people that's being talked about here. You can clearly see he was a man, a human being walking on the earth, telling people to worship God with no partners. Loving God, serving God as a servant would serve a master. That's the description that he gave. Now, when people bring these charges or allegations against Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, what are we to think about this? What should we do? What should be our reaction as Muslims? First and foremost, remember that these people don't know. They haven't had the opportunity to really be exposed to the truth of Islam. So be patient and be gentle and be kind. I realize that there are cartoons that have been drawn against him that are very vicious. I realize that there have been stories maligning his character. But at the same time, I realize that these people are ignorant. They're as ignorant or more so than the people who lived at the time of Muhammad. So be patient. When somebody comes to me and they say, how come you follow a religion with a guy in a desert that's worship in a black box. You go, what? What kind of you know, what kind of question is this? But be patient. Instead of responding and saying something to them that's vicious, you should think. This is your chance to tell them about Muhammad and say to them, thank you for asking me about my religion. And then begin to explain that Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to keep people from false worship. The very thing that you're accusing Islam of, the very thing you're telling about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the opposite. He came to teach us to worship Allah alone without partners, to believe in Allah as one, and to serve him and obey him and follow his commandments, the commandments of Allah, worshiping him without partners, taking care of our relationship with our parents, being true to our word and being honest and steadfast, never taking any innocent life, never committing adultery, never drinking alcohol, staying away from gambling. All of these things that are forbidden are a part of Islam, the teachings in the Quran. And then in our worship, never to worship anything along with Allah, not to have any statues or idols or amulets or lucky charms or following astrology or looking for any kind of thing in the creation that can give you a benefit or keep something away from you, only turning to Allah, the creator, originator of everything. These are the teachings. Now these basic teachings I've outlined here are found in the Bible, you can look in the book of Exodus chapter 20 and find this is the Ten Commandments. You can look in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5. There you are, Ten Commandments. You can look in the New Testament and see again that these commandments are upheld by Jesus. Clearly, if you believe in the Bible, if you believe there's anything in the English at all that's correct, you could look in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 and see here a clear teaching. Chapter 5, verse 17, and Jesus is saying what? Do not think I came to destroy the law. He's talking about the Torah, the Old Testament. I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, meaning the teachings of the prophets, but rather I came to fulfill. He's fulfilling exactly what they fulfilled, which is to teach people to worship God without partners. And then it continues, and not until all things be accomplished shall a single dot or jot, a tiny speck, <laughs> be changed from the law. And then it says, whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches that's a, that it's okay to do that, he'll be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. Now I want you to stop and think. Don't go any further. Stop right there. Hold on. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, forbid people to eat pork. He forbid them to eat khanzir. This is a teaching from the Bible, yes or no? Yes. You could say, well, Paul said, wait a minute. Huh. You just got here hearing Jesus saying all commandments, not even a dot's going to change. So if Paul said it's okay to eat khanzir or pork or pig meat, 
Where is he getting that from? And for sure we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi peace be upon him, forbid people to eat pork. What about circumcision? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his followers circumcised the boys, not the girls, by the way. That's another big misconception. It's in the Quran. Go check it out. Come back to this and think, wait a minute. He kept that commandment too. Paul said you didn't have to. Circumcision of the heart. See, playing with words. Now, who do you believe, Paul or Muhammad? Stop and think. Then let's come to another very important matter. And this is the issue of the treatment of people in general. We have Paul in the New Testament saying that he's all things to all people. If he's with the Jews, he's a Jew. And if he's with the Roman citizens, he's a Roman. And when he's with the Christians, he's a Christian. And he says that's all things to all people. Well, we have a name for that too. It's called hypocrite. You, you just being with saying what you want people to hear from you to, to fit in. But as a matter of fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, stayed on the truth even if people were m mad enough at him. When he said the truth, they would beat him. They would hit him. They would hurt him and his followers for just saying what? There's only one God. False gods don't work. So what we see right now is a, is a clear picture of Muhammad as what? As being a person who preaches a message and lives to that message even if it will bring harm to him in this world, he's still going to hang on to because he knows that's the message he's been sent with. So here's somebody telling you the truth according to what he knows, and you can verify it. Let me ask you to do this one thing. I'm going to wrap up this part of the program and ask you to do one thing. Go to the website called www.prophetofislam.com. Go to the website and then check for yourself. Don't take my word for it. I don't want you to do that either. I want you to go and investigate for yourself. But here's a big test for you. Do what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to do. Tell people to go inside their own heart and ask their own God to guide them. Because if you do that, the guidance is from him. Just go in your own heart and say, God, guide me, guide me. And whatever he guides you to, that's what you need. Don't worry about it. If you're honest, you're sincere, he will guide you. But don't pray to Muhammad. Nobody prays to Muhammad and gets anything out of that. Don't pray to Jesus. Don't pray to Moses. Pray to the one who created them in the first place. Ya Allah, oh God, guide me. If you sit in your heart, he'll guide you. You'll be all right. Till next time, peace. Assalamu alaikum.